listening to the Public Safety Innovators Podcast. Connecting you with experts and trendsetters who are leading innovation in law enforcement, private security, and personal protection. And now, your host, Adam Wills. Welcome to episode 28 of the Public Safety Innovators Podcast. On today's show, we will again be speaking with Lauren Rich for session two of three on our mental health series. I promise you that this is not your typical boring mental health conversation. If you haven't yet listened to episode 27, I would encourage you to go back and listen to that episode before coming back to this one. And again, we will be discussing some adult topics here. So if you normally listen to the show with kids present, please consider coming back at a later time. In this episode, Lauren and I are going to discuss some more of the similarities between combat trauma and the trauma that law enforcement endure on a day-to-day basis. We are going to discuss ways for you to prepare for and mitigate trauma, as well as address our law enforcement leaders with some encouragement to increase the quality of mental health services available to their staff. All right, let's get started with my second session with Lauren Rich. Welcome to the Public Safety Innovators Podcast. We've got Lauren Rich on the show again today for session two. Lauren, welcome back to the show. I'm surprised I'm even back. (laughs) Yeah, you know, I I thought about just cutting you off after the last episode. And you know what? If people are hearing this today, it's because, hey, Lauren didn't get me canceled. So That's right. um, Not yet. Maybe today's episode will. (laughs) Yeah, right. Uh, So last last episode, if anybody didn't listen, please go back and listen to it. But um, for, for those of you that just want a quick recap, we talked a bit about how uh, Lauren helps male combat veterans um, recover from their trauma in combat. Uh, on the last episode, she, it, she's in her, her practice in uh, Muskogee, Oklahoma. And we just talked about different challenges that uh, military combat veterans face. And uh, we talked a little bit about how uh, there's a correlation between combat veterans and law enforcement. And so we're going to unpack that a bit more on today's show. We're going to talk um, more in detail and specifically about law enforcement officers who are still on the job. And we want to talk about some of the challenges that you guys and gals face every day um, on duty and off duty during your law enforcement career, how you can um, you know, if you're if you're newer in your law enforcement career, how you can be prepared for some of those things that you're going to face uh, and know that they're coming and how you can address those and mitigate them, overcome those. Um, but also for those of you that have maybe been on the job for a while uh, and are, are further along in your career or struggling with some of these things yourself, uh, Lauren and I want to give you uh, some resources today. Uh, to to shed some light on some of those challenges and, and help you out a bit. So, Lauren, what is the? Let's just start off by talking about what are what are the similarities um, between combat veterans and what they experience in combat uh, to law enforcement and what they experience on the job every day. Well, let's let's approach it with the understanding that trauma is trauma is trauma. Okay, it it does not matter if it's sexual assault, um, child thrown from a vehicle, murder, or a deployment. All trauma that is sustained ends up coming out looking exactly the same. And by that, I mean they all have the same diagnostic criteria. And those things are things like um, hypervigilance or a, a heightened startle response, anxiety episodes or chronic anxiety, depressive episodes, um, nightmares sometimes, flashbacks or recollections, uh, intrusive thoughts. And what we mean by that is you're minding your own business, mowing the lawn, helping your kid, whatever. And uh, all of a sudden that awful image pops in your head. Um, 
other triggers or correlations maybe to sight sounds or smells. Um, and you experienced that the other day when I got in my, <laughs> yes, I got I did. In my, we were, we were prepping for the podcast and I, um, since I'm an hour ahead of you, I was going to pick up a kiddo and I got right. in my truck and you heard the, what do you call that? Um, the chime, the door the chime. chime. The, yeah. And the I stopped chime. in mid conversation. I said, <laughs> Lauren, you, you drive a Ford. And she says, <laughs> yeah. yes, I do. And she said, you must drive a Ford too. And I said, no, I actually don't. But uh, that door chime um, brought back like this flood of things that I was not anticipating because uh, back when I was, when I was, before I became an administrator um, and when I was still just on the road full time, I had one of the, the Ford Taurus SHO uh, patrol cars when they first came out. Um, I was one of the lucky guys at our agency that got one of those new cars and that stupid door chime used to piss me off because I was like, when I got that car and I first heard that chime, I'm like, oh my gosh, everybody's going to hear me coming. I'm not going to be able to open my door without people knowing that I'm getting out of my patrol car. And, you know, I'm not going to be able to, people are going to think that I left the keys in, which I did sometimes, you know, uh, um, Anyway, that, it it really caused me a lot of stress. That stupid door chime, and uh, it clearly um, it clearly caught you off guard. <laughs> I remember going into the yeah. shops and being so, like, "Can you guys shut this thing off? Is there a way to disable this thing?" Off. And anyway, it it was ingrained in my memory, and I started associating that chime with mm-hmm. um, other like actual in progress incidents that happened where apparently. In the back of my so, mind, even though I didn't realize this at the time, I thought, oh, man, this chime is going to get me in trouble. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So let's take let's take your response the other day. That's actually pretty perfect timing. So your response mid sentence was <gasps> you drive a Ford. And I said, yes, but that was your verbal response. What was your physical response? How did your body feel when you heard that noise? Uh, you know, I, I, I think I kind of like. I got a little bit excited and tensed up a bit. Uh, uh-huh. I, I became tensed very up, heightened. Anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. Your blood pressure yeah. probably went up a little bit. Yeah. Okay. My blood so pressure's that's always a, up. But. <laughs> that, <laughs> I have that effect on men. Um, that's a simple correlation between uh, past events, you know, pseudo trauma, and then um, a present day trigger. And because if we take it off the approach that our that trauma is stored in our nervous system, um, then it would make sense why sight, sound, smells are stored and, and how our hippocampus files those. And then things that normally wouldn't be bothersome or normally wouldn't be a trigger at all end up being a trigger to past memories or events. Um, and so you all will have a lot of those. And I've had officers come in before who um, they say, you know, I'm just tired of seeing dead kids. I'm really tired of that. I'm tired of looking at my kid and seeing dead kids. And uh, if that's where you are, you need to go get that shit fixed before it destroys your life because it will. It absolutely will. Um, and, And I should also say that my stance as a provider is that it is a privilege to sit with you all each and every day and to have my job, I would not trade it for anything in the world. Maybe in my second life, I'd go be a landscaper. But other than that, other than that, where I can actually see a tangible result right away within five to 10 minutes, um, other than just having to be committed to working at it, it is, it is a privilege for you to serve and it is a privilege for me to help you through that process. So don't think that I take that for granted either. Um, if you you have a few choices in life. If you're a present day officer who's experiencing a lot of stress or maybe having some issues and they are manifesting, whether in your behavior, um, in your marriage, in your workaholism, so to speak, you can either choose to do, one option is that you do absolutely nothing and that you keep chooching along just as you are. Um, The second option is that you take mild approaches that you think you can change on your own without assistance. Um, And the third approach is that you actually seek professional help. And 
there's no fault in that. I, I have police officers and veterans that I have seen for a long time. Um, they're absolutely wonderful people. It doesn't make them any less qualified for their job. I know that's a lot of the fear and we can talk about that. But if you've tried step number two of implementing small things in, in your daily life, like let's say not drinking as much um, and you still can't get there, you probably need to go see somebody. Man, you just, we, we just totally, <laughs> there's a laundry list there of things to talk about now, um, which mm -hmm. is, which is awesome. And, and how some of those things manifest, I, I, those, we talked about the association of sights and smells and, and feel like actual touch feelings, right? Do those things, do those things ever go away or are those always there just kind of latent? Because I, I totally you know, going back to that chime, I didn't expect that. Like that was totally unexpected to me. Apparently it's been a while since I've been around a Ford. Um, but that was, that was a very unexpected reaction that I had when I heard that sound. And the fact that it, it brought back specific memories of, of, of actual events and, um, that I could, that I could picture, I could envision. And so does that, does that ever change or are those always there? And we just have to learn to, accept them, know that they're there and, and not be, uh, not be worried about them. Well, I'll give you the attorney answer that it depends. It depends on the trauma and it depends on the person. A lot of times people yeah. can process information and they don't need, um, an extra, an extra help. They can, their mind can do that on their own. Um, a lot of times things will get better as the years pass or, or as time passes. Um, most people can resolve trauma within the first three months of the event. If they can't resolve it within the first three months of the event, then they need to, they need to go see somebody. Um, so do they ever completely go away? Um, I am really skeptical about that. Some, some people say that PTS or, or post-trauma symptoms can go away completely. Um, I don't have that belief. I don't subscribe to that belief simply because once the toothpaste is out of the tube, you can't put it back in. You can't unsee trauma. You can't unsee dead children. You can't unsee beaten women. You can't unsee massive car wrecks or things that are on fire it's impossible. We can't go back and undo that. So how could we possibly expect that the memory, the image, the sight, the sound will also go away? And, and sometimes yeah. that's the expectation when people come in is they say, will this go away? I don't ever make them the promise that it will go away. And, and my promise is we can reduce it in severity or, or intensity and in frequency. And if we can get nightmares down from I had one guy who started with me who had them uh, three or four times a night. It was awful. Um, and we've gotten them down to once a week. That's huge progress. Three to four per night down to once a week. I had another guy who was having them nightly, and we've gotten them down to monthly, which is amazing. That is amazing. So if you can simply um, learn to accept that trauma makes us who we are, it really does. Um, we don't want to undo that. Those events deserve our respect. They've earned our respect. And if we take it with that approach, then I think people are more comfortable saying, I can tolerate one nightmare a month. That's not, that's not bad. That's not bad. And I have the nightmare. Um, I give it the attention that it needs. And then I go back to sleep and life goes on. Yeah. Well, so I guess the, the question that leaves me with then too is, uh, and, and this is sort of on a personal level, if you will, but th that, um, that incident that we just talked about, or that, uh, you know, with the door chime, what, what that, what that aroused in me, uh, isn't something that I would characterize as trauma or PTSD necessarily. The, those, those are times like those, those pictures I had in my memory, in my mind were, times where certainly my awareness and my adrenaline were very heightened. And so obviously something about that has, you know, burned it into my memory, but I wouldn't, there was nothing about those particular incidents that were traumatic. They were just, um, they're ingrained in my memory. And I think that's really what we have to talk about today because I, I would say, and, and I'm making this assumption, Lauren, without having cleared this with you first. Um, <laughs> but that, <laughs> there's there's a bit of a paradigm shift to be had here because I think we make the assumption 
that um, if if we don't have trauma, right? If there's not things that are keeping me awake at night, there's not things that I'm struggling to be able to reconcile with or reason with that I don't have. It's not impacting me. And I think that's wrong. And I think that's what we want to overcome here today because I I was very fortunate in my law enforcement career, although I have seen my fair share of, of the nasty stuff that I could tell stories about all day long. There's none of that that I feel like is unresolved or unreconciled for me. I don't feel like I carry trauma, but those experiences over 15 years in law enforcement have obviously changed and shaped who I am, how I see the world, how I interact with those around me. And that's what we want to bring awareness and recognition to today is to get people to recognize that it's not just about trauma. It's not just about PTSD. It's about recognizing that this job carries with it a, a level of uh, psychological and emotional burden that is going to impact who you are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So a couple of things. One is in today's modern world, and, and again, back to the Frankfurt School and, and what I referenced last time, which kind of laid the foundation for the understanding and the philosophical processing that we're about to talk about, is that everything is relative, right? It's all relative. You know, all trauma is relative. And that's part of my beef with the world of, of mental health is that they'll say, well, you know, it's traumatic for people to be bullied or for their parents to be divorced or to go to combat. It's all trauma. Trauma is all relative. Well, the problem with that is that there's no objective reality. There's no agreed upon trauma. The ironic thing about that is that this same field has created diagnostic categories. And what do diagnostic categories have to have? They have to have an objective reality. They have to have a certain number of people that report the same symptoms in order to create a diagnosis. That's how we end up with things like PTSD, anxiety disorder, schizophrenia. And so in our world, I always say that trauma is in a clinical sense defined by a near-death experience, either taking part in, witnessing, or learning about, okay? And that's actually what the diagnostic book says. The The field will tell you, well, there's large T trauma and little T trauma. So even though it's not a near-death experience, it may be bullying, divorce of a parent, or um, let's, you know, let's say something on the, the lighter end, so to speak, that can still be traumatic. And while that's true, I can see that in part. Um, I don't think it's fair to call that trauma because again, if we're, if we're utilizing a diagnostic category, then we have to have an objective reality. Um, no one ever calls and says, Hey doc, I've had major trauma. They always call and they say, I'm anxious as hell. I'm about to crawl out of my skin. Um, I'm depressed. I can hardly get out of bed. I'm drinking too much. Um, I drink at the morning news. You know, I hide it in the cereal um, area in my cupboard so that my kids don't find it or, or whatever that may be. Um, no one ever calls and says, hey, doc, I've been through major trauma. They always call with whatever the manifestation of trauma actually is. Sure. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Okay. Okay. So, so in, in, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just no, going to say in our discussion of trauma, um, we are, we are really talking about those near death or violent experiences. That is an objective reality for law enforcement, firemen, police officers, that type of thing. And one of the, I think one of the major shifts from military life to law enforcement life is that military members witness trauma against one another a lot, primarily from the enemy. Okay. Occasionally there's infighting or um, people who've completely gone off their rocker. Um, you know, infidelity is an issue in both the police departments and in, in military life. Um, and so most of the time, though, the trauma that they receive is, is coming from an enemy combatant. The issue in police work, in my opinion, is that a lot of times we serve with people who we assume are as good hearted and as morally driven as we are. And then they end up violating that agreement. And we end up with fam- what, for lack of a better phrase, familial trauma. Okay. Blue trauma, so to speak. Um, and I'll give you an example of that. So the uh, the same week that I was at a sex offender conference in Texas, learning about treatment for men, again, 
see men of all all issues, um, and I do evaluations for courts and for attorneys and things like that. Um, I'm at this conference, and they're talking about um, opportunity in regards to pedophilia. And this particular example had to do with a school bus driver. He drove uh, six and seven-year-olds, first and second graders, but he preferred sexually four and five-year-olds. And when they asked him, I couldn't believe this. The school did not see this as a red flag that this man who made seventy, eighty thousand dollars in the oil field left to go take a eighteen thousand dollar job as a bus driver. That wasn't alarming to anyone, apparently. Um, and after perpetrating, they said, "Why did you choose that age?" And he said, "It was just accessible. It wasn't my preference." That same week that I was at that conference, I picked my daughter up from school and said, what did you learn about today? And she said, helpers in the community, the postman, the policeman, the fireman, the bus driver, all of those kinds Mm -hmm. of things. And ironically, that same week, the fireman in our small town, who was the fire clown, for lack of a better phrase, um, was charged with child sexual abuse. He had dated this woman and he had repeatedly raped and molested her four-year-old daughter and videotaped it. Um, And everyone was shocked, appalled um, that this guy who had grown up here, who was supposed to be an honorable person of the same moral and ethical guidelines, had violated that quote-unquote family trust and hurt a child. And so sometimes with law enforcement and firemen, our trauma is within our family. It's not just the people that we interact with in the public. It's our coworkers and colleagues who we are supposed to trust with our lives. What does that do to us? Yeah, that's a that's an excellent point. And, and unfortunately, I've had to experience some of those things myself in my law enforcement yes. career. People that I that I worked hand in hand with that. Mm-hmm. got caught doing things they shouldn't have been doing. And it was a shock to everybody. And so um, that's, that's something I didn't think about. And I think um, yeah. sort of a correlation to that in talking about some of the unique challenges that law enforcement faced that is almost in a way, um, you know, I'm going to step out on a limb here. I'm not a, I'm not a veteran. <laughs> I've never been in a combat zone. So some people might get mad at me for saying this, but um, in, in some ways there are things that I think actually make being in law enforcement more traumatic and more challenging than being in a war zone. And here's, here's why I'm going to say that. Okay. If, if I am in the military and I get deployed overseas to Iraq, I'm, 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 I'm going over there with the knowledge that I am entering a war zone. I am going right. there to bring violence on people. That is my mission. I'm going there to bring violence. I am going to fight and probably kill people. Um, and there is going to be violence that I am surrounded with. That is the purpose of me being there. And that place is not my home. I am going there to bring violence and come back home. Okay. Because I want to keep the violence from entering my home. Right. That's right. On the other side of that, when we go into law enforcement, um, I am going to work every day in my community, hoping not to bring violence to anybody. My goal is to is to to see peace and be that thin blue line between chaos and disorder. And and when the violence comes, I will I will respond to that call to bring violence. But it's not what I want. It's not what I feel like my mission is. And I'm almost regretful that I have to do it. Right. Um, so there's there's a difference there. Um, and, and also. It's in the community that I live in. I'm having to bring violence in the community I live in to the people that I am neighbored with. And that I think is a lot more um, traumatizing or at least traumatizing in different ways than what what you experience in, in combat. It's just a different flavor. You know, when yeah, you have to arrest yeah. the bus driver. I'm not trying to minimize your... the, the, the oh, trauma. Yeah, no, that, I, com- I completely see what you're saying. veterans experience. When you have to arrest the bus driver or the fireman who drives your neighborhood children to and from school, who is the the fireman clown on fire truck day every single year, that will really mess with your head because these are people who you have trusted again in your community. And more importantly, you can't leave it. It's, it's again, it's not like the battlefield where we get to leave it behind physically. It's always there. And sometimes the battlefield seeps into your own household. And dare I say, blue drama, (laughs) blue drama is some of the worst drama. 
because that crowd, your crowd in particular, um, doesn't want to go see anybody. They don't want anybody to know what's going on. Uh, the infidelity rate is awful. The, the amount of drama that starts because officers are sleeping with other officers' wives or whatever that may be, vice versa, um, is, is just terrible. It is absolutely terrible. And all we're doing is tacking more trauma on top of more trauma. Yeah. So let, let's talk about, uh, you, you said that, especially in law enforcement, my people <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't want to go seek help. And, and I, and I would agree with you. I mean, I've seen that, um, uh, a fair amount, uh, myself and I, I I guess first the question is wh why is that? What what is that rooted in? I mean, I think obviously there's a sense of pride, um, mm -hmm. and there's also a sense of of fear of being found out, right? Because we worry that okay, just because I'm struggling with something that I think is insignificant, but I know that I need to address it early on, um, somebody is going to think that I am not capable of doing my job. There's going to be this overreaction. I'm going to get put on. I'm going to be riding pine. Uh, you know, and, and so there's this temptation to just let it build because, well, if it's insignificant, I should be able to handle it. And so we just let it mm -hmm. build up until it becomes this, this boil over. And, uh, I, I don't, what do you, what do you think that's rooted in and how do we overcome it? Well, I think there's a, I think there's a couple issues. One is simply the environmental stigma. You know, the, um, the, the, first of all, the fear that you could lose your creds. Um, for going to seek help is probably number one. And I was recently on a Fletzy call where I provided a, a training to the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center out of Artesia, New Mexico. And they had a State Department guy on the telephone um, in the conference. And he said, oh, yeah, we have this peer support program and people can call and it's a really great thing. Well, <laughs> my source, who's a special agent with the State Department, said, and I quote, they eat their own. So you may go in for help, but you end up going up for retention review. And that's why no one wants to go in. And um, and so reality, you know, theory and application are two very different things when it comes to law enforcement or um, any type of agency work like that. So one is people are desperately afraid of losing their job or their clearance. And I completely understand that, um, which is a great reason to see somebody outside of the department. If you have embedded mental health, I cannot fault you for going outside. I would probably encourage you to do that. Um, the second is use your insurance, but the third is use cash if you need to. And I've had police chiefs from other towns who have come to see me who use cash. Um, and they'll say you have an empty, um, not empty, but um, you have a vague building. There's no markings. There are other businesses. No one really knows why I'm here. And I know you haven't ever been to my office, but I have no signage on my office at all. It's not on the marquee. It's not on the door. Um, I had a sign up there that used to say Rich Consulting on the door. And people would pop in and say, what do you do? And I would have to say, get out of here. You do not, <laughs> you don't belong here. Um, if you, if you don't know what I do, then you don't need to be here. And so the only, <laughs> yes, exactly. And so the only information that's in the building is that it's suite 20. And other than that, people have no idea what I do. They don't have a clue of what service I offer. Um, so part of that is fighting the stigma and, and fighting the fear of losing creds. And ultimately you as an officer have to weigh uh, is it a greater danger to go seek help and get my shit taken care of? Or is it a greater danger to not address it and let it fester? If you meet with a provider, you need to tell them, I'm concerned about my job, my clearance, my creds, and make an agreement with them that they chart vaguely. I do that all the time. You could come in and audit my notes and you'd have no earthly idea what we talk about. It's all in code. And if it is in code at all, you wouldn't understand it anyway. Um, and that, that is for your protection. That is for your privacy to keep your job. Because above all else, you have to keep your job. Um, the second thing is, again, I think we work to emasculate men in the world of psychology. Um, you know, being, uh, gosh, being a man who protects women, gosh, that's toxic masculinity. And so who's going to go see a provider who subscribes to that when they're in 
law enforcement. That is completely right. contradictory. And so as much as they say it's stigmatized and there's guilt and there's shame, yeah, there's some of that. But we're, again, it's just not a very welcoming place for the traditional man. And, and I don't fault them for coming. Um, I live in a great red state. You live in a very blue state. (laughs) And in my state, we have something called constitutional carry. And it's a wonderful thing. Um, We also just passed a Second Amendment sanctuary law, um, which helps protect people's firearms and their rights. I have never in my career had anyone lose their firearms or their credentials for seeking mental health help. And I attribute that to a really great working alliance. I don't attribute that to being a great provider. I attribute that to having a great therapeutic alliance and both of us doing our part to keep you in your job. That's the entire goal. And so even if people aren't worried about losing their creds, they're worried about losing their hunting rifle or the AK-47 that they own, or uh, that's a terrible example, or the AR-15 that they own, you know, whatever it may be. Um, <laughs> right. They are fearful of losing all of those things. And so even if you're not law enforcement, you don't want to seek help because, well, she's going to write in there that I have firearms and they're going to take them away. And let me tell you what, this is rural Oklahoma, and I grew up in rural Oklahoma. When I sit with a veteran and I say, how many firearms do you own? And they say none. I just laugh because it's such a lie. So yeah. I make the assumption that you own at least six. That is the, that is the <laughs> assumption on my part. Um, if right. you're in California, though, you don't, mm. you don't have that constitutional carry opportunity. You know, you have to prove why you even need a concealed carry. And so um, depending on where you are, the risk may be perceived risk, maybe um lesser or greater in seeking help. Um, In regards to suicide, I think law enforcement officers are especially afraid to admit this, just as they are in the veteran community. But I looked it up for you. And according to Blue Help, based out of Massachusetts, they're a nonprofit that works to reduce stigma. In 2019, there were 228 law enforcement officer suicides. However, There's a caveat to that because departments are not required to report suicide statistics to any national body. So they rely on individual departments reaching out to them or confirming the number of suicides that they've experienced in the year. So that number is low. Oh, it's got to be drastically low. Easily. And ironically, if you look at the states where the suicide numbers are highest for law enforcement officers, do you want to take a guess where they are? Uh, California. California, Uh, New York, New York, Illinois, Texas, Florida. And it's not just because of mass population. It's because of culture where I hate to say this, but sometimes you're shot just because you're wearing a uniform. You know, yeah, that happened. That happened. That happens. That happens. So can I, let me share something by comparison here too. And, and if, if you were, if you were going here, I'm sorry for stealing your thunder in advance, but um, to, to, to compare that number, you said it was how many? 219? They report 228 in 2019. Okay. Okay. 228 suicides. So I just looked up how many line of duty deaths in 2019. Oh, it out. It's One, to the point where law enforcement suicide outnumbers line of duty deaths. Mm-hmm. 150. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, not not that I'm saying we should ignore the fact that cops are being killed in the line of duty and the violence that we face and those challenges there, Mm -hmm. but obviously we have a bigger problem on our hands, don't we? Mm -hmm. Yes, a much bigger problem. And the more politically um, opposed we become to one another, the greater the problem will be. Um, you know, and, and I have police officers in my family. I have a, a Tulsa cop cousin who he is just the sweetest man ever. He doesn't write enough tickets. Um, and you know, there's still concern that the sweetest officer ever who doesn't write enough tickets will get shot sitting in his car just because he's a cop. You know, yeah. um, I brought that up to a provider. This had to have been three years ago. And this woman was the daughter of an army colonel. And, and we were at work one day and I developed a really great working relationship with federal police officers at the VA. And I made a comment to her that, you know, police officers are getting shot just because they're sitting in their car because this African-American or black female officer, that is exactly what happened to her. And I don't know if you remember that one. And the provider looked at me and she said, don't you think that's an exaggeration? And I said, no, I I don't. 
I, I don't think it's an exaggeration. Pop her square in the jaw. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, piled, <laughs> piled higher and deeper. Um, but yeah, that was yeah. her response. Was don't you think that's an exaggeration? And you know. I, I understand that some people have embedded mental health in their department. That's a challenge if you're seeing this person socially outside of the department. Um, it's a challenge to walk into their door because everyone knows that you're seeing them and what they do. Um, so find somebody who's who's going to be able to protect your privacy. And if that means that you have to drive to the next town over, drive to the next town over. Make it, make so it worth your while. Let's talk about that a little bit more about the idea of embedded mental health, because I want to, mm -hmm. I want to clarify that with you. And, and I just want to, I want to say here real quick, um, you know, we've kind of been talking to uh, fellow law enforcement officers in general so far on this episode. And, and not that we're not going to continue to do that, but right now I want to specifically call out those um, who are leaders in their law enforcement agency. And I, I don't, I don't really care at what level, right? At what rank you, you're a leader. Um, my personal opinion, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you're in municipal law enforcement, federal law enforcement, uh, county law enforcement. Uh, I, I think far too often law enforcement agencies rely really heavily on their um, governing body. So their, their county, their municipality uh, to provide those mental health services. And, and what I have seen over and over and over and over again, and I believe that this is true a hundred percent of the time I am, I'm, I'm putting my, my flag on that, that this is true a hundred percent of the time, those mental health services that are provided at the County municipality level are not tailored or catered to law enforcement. And they're not sufficient enough. They're looking at the, you know, road and bridge grader driver and the, uh, whatever the trash truck guy, right. And, and dealing with the problems that those people are facing, because that makes up the bulk of the workforce that the County and the city is, uh, having to address. They're not thinking about the, the types of challenges that law enforcement, uh, are facing. And, and in large part, cause they don't understand it. And so the reason why I want to call out those of you on that are listening to the show that are leaders in your agency is because it's up to you to advocate to your city, your county, that what is being provided is not good enough and that something else needs to happen. And so that is my preface to the question I'm about to ask you now as we, we sort of dive into talking about this a little bit more on that administrative level, Lauren. And that's, can you define for me what is embedded mental health to you? What, what, what qualifies as that? I, I would constitute embedded mental health as someone who is in your department uh, and treats the officers is not the, the embedded mental health person that I'm talking about does not necessarily focus on the public and their mental health and your interaction with them. They are there to help you sustain your job. That's my definition of, of embedded mental health. Okay. So is it somebody that uh, works for the the city or the county, or is that somebody that is contracted by, or, or is it both? both. But I, okay. I would say both. I would say both. Okay. Mm -hmm. And are you seeing that in most cases where this this provider is actually on the premise of uh, you know the the law enforcement, the government building, whatever it may be for your area, or is this completely outside of that you know that that governmental complex, if you will. I, I think there are some municipalities that are getting to that. Some of those positions are grant funded so that they can have a mental health provider um, in the department that's accessible. The theory is great. Again, the, the theory is absolutely wonderful, but then actual execution is completely different. And let's take the VA as an example. Um, they are especially complicated because as a clinician, they are required to get their fitness for duty uh, reports from an internal VA clinician. What does that create? That creates a conflict of interest, right? Yes. So the same person who's going to give me my fit rep every year may also call me because they have a disruptive veteran who they want me to deal with. And what happens to me when I don't agree with the clinician and I don't, um, mm -hmm. I don't do what the clinician wants when the, when the veteran is disruptive? Or am I going to be penalized for that when my fit rep comes around? 
Well, and it creates you an know, echo fact, chamber. So there's there's no opportunity there for stepping outside and and, and doing different things and being unorthodox right. and, and trying new things that might benefit somebody. That's right. And I, I saw a number of veterans um, when I, I'm sorry, a number of veterans. I saw a number of police officers when I worked at the VA, but I earned that. I earned that privilege. Um, and I earned it because ironically, um, in July of 16, I, I had a veteran come into my office who was a two-time deployer and he had never been seen by anybody else. It was very odd that I was his first appointment. And so I said, we need to get you with primary care. Let's call the business office. I had a salty Marine that I knew and loved. And I said, hey, what's the deal? Why is this guy not seeing primary care yet? And he said, we don't have his DD-214. Well, by law, any veteran can access the VA without giving a DD-214. Eventually, they have to provide it, but medical care cannot be denied. So I looked at the veteran and I said, we need a copy of your DD-214. It was burned in a fire. Well, guess what? There are magical words that I can say on requests that I learned working in the homeless program that will expedite DD-214s. So I said, okay, I can fix that for you. And about five days later, I get a packet in the mail and it's filled with court martial paperwork. He had gone AWOL and had been AWOL for eight years and never come back. And so I talked to my friends at the VA police department. I called Fort Lewis, Washington. I basically did all of the work um, so that they wouldn't have to. And I handed them the packet and said, here you go. He's AWOL. So have at it, do whatever you want. He's yours. Um, and he was scheduled to come back in. A tornado hit the building and we were shut down for half the day. So two months later, he comes back in for a primary care appointment and they arrest him on the spot. And he said, how did you know? And they said, we have our ways. And so I earned that. I earned that spot with them. I earned that via vague charting, via privacy, via protection, um, via being available. I earned that by being their colleague and not necessarily their provider. And that's a really fine line that people have to walk. And I'm not saying that I'm the greatest at it, but I really tried my hardest to never abuse that relationship, to never violate their privacy, um, to, again, protect everything that we could in their chart because other people can see what's in your mental health record at the VA as a, as a VA police officer. Um, but it took me a while to earn that trust. And as soon as I earned it with one, I earned it with a lot others. But it just it just took a while. Yeah. So what can, um, what can an agency administrator do? Like, uh, somebody who's leading a law enforcement agency, mm -hmm. if, if they're listening to the show right now and they're thinking, man, our, our mental health resources are, are really thin and, nil. um, not good enough or nil. Yeah. Like you said, nil. Mm -hmm. And, and I can, um, I can share with you my personal experience with that too. Um, and, and the challenges that I faced when I was under sheriff and, and not having anything and trying to create something out of that. But what, what can, what can they do to address that problem, put something in place? What is a good program look like? I would say, first of all, find somebody outside of your agency, a go-to provider in your community or the next community over. Uh, and, and really that's through the grapevine work, learning who's good and who's quality and who's trustworthy. And, and more importantly, who specializes in trauma treatment, um, who has a similar mentality to those officers that you employ. And a really, I would approach a couple providers about it. And I would say, look, we need a go-to person that's not an EAP program. EAP programs are meant for divorce, maybe some alcoholism, financial stress, and really the limit is about six sessions. And then they're expected to go find a provider uh, on a full-time basis. And so if I was the head of a department, I would look at providers in the area. I would ask around and maybe ask some primary care doctors who they refer to. And then I would just kind of start interviewing providers, pick two or three, pick two or three that you think could be top contenders. And I would approach them and say, look, we would like to have a... Um, an agreement or maybe a um, some type of contract with you that allows um, us to come see you. And, and it can be approved by the city attorney if you need it to, um, that even requires extra protection. And, and sometimes there is that agreement because with security clearances, especially, you know, counterterrorism, whatever that may be, um, we have to have 
extra, extra layers of privacy. And so I have worked with attorneys before who have drafted paperwork that we both sign that says there is a non-disclosure agreement on top of the already existing non-disclosure agreement. Um, And so most importantly, I would say find somebody who's qualified, somebody who you feel like your officers could have an ongoing relationship with, and someone who is removed from the department. And if, if you need help finding those providers, I will again send it out to my listserv and we'll find you three or four in the area, and then you can kind of start perusing through and inter- interviewing. But um, I would say that's probably the simplest way is you're going to need to go to them because as a provider, it is just damn near impossible to break into a police department and say, hey, let me help you. You know, that never <laughs> that never sells well. Um, they think that there are ulterior motives or whatever it may be. And so if you approach them, I think you'll be you'll be much better off. Yeah, I think that's good advice. And, um, you know, I, I faced this challenge myself, uh, when, with my own agency, uh, as under sheriff and took a look at what we had. And I mean, what we were doing was just not good enough. And, and we were using mm-hmm. the county's EIP program. And, uh, you know, I looked at that and said, this just, this doesn't cut it. Like this, this isn't good enough for what, um, our guys need. And so, um, I, I'd reached out to somebody I had already had a prior relationship with. So that helped who was a therapist in specifically dealing with first responders, law enforcement, fire, EMS. And Mm -hmm. we brought him in, got him under contract directly with the sheriff's office, um, not with the County, but with the sheriff's office specifically. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, put it into place so that we ensured that uh, our, our healthcare plan that we provided our employees would qualify with him. So if anybody wanted to go see him on their own, they could, you know, they could pay a copay and, and be done with it. Right. And there was that layer, uh, like you said, of, of privacy that, that we were, um, able to enjoy there. And, and it was just, it was important for our staff to know that they had somebody that they could go see that was, uh, that was well-versed in what they were dealing with, not just some, you know, therapist mm-hmm. that deals with people getting divorced, yeah, generalist. Or drinking, you know, too much. Yes. Yeah, the generalist. Yes, um, exactly, exactly. And, we, and and I would say if you if you cannot create that program, I mean, if you're the head of a department, you can eventually create whatever you want. You know, if you if you pitch it right. But um, if you're just kind of in the beginning and you need to maybe have some extra training or anything like that, um, Travis House is actually my recommendation. He is a super nice guy. I know him personally, um, and he's. He's really one who um, his story is quite beneficial for a number of reasons, but um, was he was a, a Marine infantry guy. Uh, he was out before 9-11, so he, he never saw combat, but he goes into the fire service and then the police department and then back to the fire service. And he's one who his his major trauma um, is when he lost nine fellow firefighters in a burning building. And, and basically had to pull out their bodies and live with that trauma. And so, again, it's kind of that familial trauma like we talked about earlier. Um, but he owns the fact that he was actively suicidal. He's drinking himself into obliteration, basically, just to go to sleep at night, to not have nightmares, um, to function. And um, he, his, he has written a book called Create Your Own Light. And he has a podcast that I think comes out weekly, if I remember right. But um, he now offers trainings and speaking engagements to departments around the country, whether it's IMSA, fire, or police. And um, I think he is just an exceptional person, not just because of his experience, but what he has done with his experience. Uh, And again, his is that inner inner department trauma. It's not necessarily trauma sustained from the enemy or from the general public. It's loss. And it's loss that so many of you experience, but that you never actually get to process. Um, And so I would encourage everybody to go go read his book, go listen to his podcast and uh, just hear what he has to say, because he has a very similar story to a lot of you who are geez, drinking with the six o'clock news. And I, I don't mean the six P news. I mean the six A news. <laughs> Labat Le- blue and lucky charms. Yes. Wow. Boy, <laughs> you have quite the, quite the classy palette. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying, I'm not saying I do that now, but there was, well, there was a time in college where there was, there was some, 
<laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't mind, I don't mind the Labatt, the Lucky Charms. I could live without. Um, you know, and and when you think about how do we set this up in our department, do we, if we can create a mental health program, do we make it mandatory or do we make it voluntary? I was just going to ask you about that. What is your, you know? what is your stance on that? I'm really torn. I really am. I think voluntary is great. On the other hand, when you make it mandated, everybody has to attend. And then no one knows who's really going and who's really not going. And so in an, in a certain sense, mandated attendance uh, protects everyone's privacy. And I tell guys all the time, I don't care if you come in here and we just shoot the shit about college football. We can do that. Um, we just need to ensure that we that we check the box um, so you're talking about them actually coming to see you one-on-one -on -one, not like group mm -hmm. uh not, not a group training so to speak so travis would be a great one for group training group mental health so for a good mm, i would say two decades the world of trauma um, including the Department of veterans affairs endorsed that group trauma therapy was the best and most productive and now for the past decade we're taking that back and so um, they're saying that group therapy actually for trauma is not productive, that it gets uh, less uh, quality or um, worse results than individual one-on-one -on -one therapy. And if you think that you're going to get a bunch of cops together to talk about trauma and how that impacted them, you're out of your mind. I don't know who yeah, on earth. I, I, <laughs> I don't necessarily mean group therapy, but uh, mm -hmm. what we did, what we did at my agency after we contracted um, with this therapist I was talking about earlier um, we brought him in to do, I mean, it was, it was more about resiliency and awareness of, mm -hmm. you know, what sort of things you might be facing and how to recognize early warning signs and when you need to address things. Right. And so, um, and we did make that mandatory. So we, mm -hmm. we had him come for two days and the first day we sent half of our agency went, went to training and it, it was mandatory. Everybody had to go. Um, it was more like a classroom style thing. It wasn't group therapy. It was just classroom training. And mm -hmm. everybody had to go on that one day. And then everybody, obviously, the other half of everybody went the next day. But the other thing that we did that really was actually really well received by people and everybody loved it. The feedback we got was phenomenal. That night, he stayed over um, and we had a spouses session and all of our staff invited their spouses to come. And so everybody had to go home and deal with the kids and, you know, <laughs> deal with putting dinner on the table and putting kids off the bed. Well, the spouses came and had a session of their own from like 6 p.m. I think it was like eight or nine or something like that. And um, and and they just learned about the type of things um, that we as law enforcement are dealing with on the job. And it's not that they don't understand. I mean, they hear it from us every day, but to hear it from that clinical mm -hmm. side of this is what you might be seeing uh, happen at home. And, and here's what, it, what that's mm -hmm. a, a result of. And how do we, how do we help our spouse when they're going through something? Do we, do we walk away and give them their space? Do we try to talk to, do we force them to talk through it with us? You know, how do we respond to that? And, not only did uh, the spouses really respond positively to that, saying that it opened their eyes to really what their significant other was going through at work and how to um, deal with it at home, um, but it also allowed our staff to, they came back and said, I feel like there's less pressure now when I go home. I feel like my spouse is, is able to oh, understand good. what I'm going through and, and not not necessarily mm -hmm. pushing that as hard. And so that's what I mean. I guess that's what I was thinking about with the mandatory versus voluntary. Mm -hmm. We did make that mandatory. But as far as anybody actually going to see the provider oh, one-on-one, -on -one, that was voluntary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And and I think that that should be mandatory for everybody. And if you're, if you're one who's skeptical and you just think I'm off on a limb, whatever it may be. Um, if nothing else, approach this from a money standpoint. If your retention rate or your attrition rate is just awful and you can't figure out why, it could be because of officer burnout and the lack of support. And so by creating 
an outlet for people. And yes, you're spending city money. I get that you're going to have to advocate for that. But by creating this outlet for your officers, you're creating long-term employees, which means that you don't have to put people, new people, through an academy. It means you don't have to have extra officers cover while that spot is vacant. Um, It means a lot of really positive things for your department in regards to long-term financial stability if you can figure out how to support people better. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Lauren, um, I want to I want to kind of wrap up this session with you here, um, which it's kind of comical because uh, for those of you listening, Lauren and I were actually talking about trying to keep these um, these sessions a little bit shorter than my typical podcast. And uh, so far on session two, both of them have been just as long as my typical podcast, which I mean, there's there's a lot to talk about here and unpack. and, And I don't think it's been boring at all. I hope everybody has stuck with it. Um, and, and we'll come back for the third session where we are going to talk about, um, what, uh, what things look like in transition, you know, when you leave law enforcement to transition back to the civilian life, whether that's retirement or maybe you're transitioning to the public sector or or the the private sector, uh, for employment, or maybe starting your own job. There's a lot of copreneurs that listen to the show. Um, and so we're going to talk about, how do you how do you be prepared for the things that uh, you're going to have to uh, the challenges you're going to face as a result of your time in a career of law enforcement? And so I hope everybody will come back for that, um, Lauren. I just want to kind of wrap up and talk a little bit about um, how can we what or what advice do you have for cops that are still on the job? How can they recognize? when they actually need to seek help, how do they do it? How can, how can we right now, you and I empower them to overcome this, this hurdle of, uh, you know, that pride that's blocking them from saying they need help. Um, you know, what, what can, what resources are out there as well to, uh, to prepare for that? Well, in regards to knowing when to seek help, it's, it's things like, what am I at risk for, of losing? Is my wife saying she's going to leave? Um, am I going to lose custody of my kids? Am I risking a DUI? Uh, is my job at risk? And, and it, essentially, my brief sales pitch for that is, how do we keep good cops out of jail? Good cops don't go to jail because they're bad people. They go to jail because they make stupid decisions, like driving drunk that type of thing. Um, And so you really have to think about what am I at risk for losing? That's, that's definitely number one. Number two is what's my substance use like? What are my relationships like? Um, Am I able to parent? Am I um, literally being a cop and nobody else? In other words, am I working 16 hour days and not doing anything with my family? You know, does my, has my wife told me that she's lonely or that I'm absent? those types of things. Um, As far as resources go, find somebody that you like and that you trust. And if nothing else, you know, cop, I mean, geez, cops and cops just go together. I mean, it's almost like it's too much so um, at certain points where no one outside your circle or no one in your circle is not blue or no one in your circle isn't red, so to speak. And so even though you have that camaraderie with others, that's not good enough. It's supportive, but it's not processing of trauma. And so you're going to actually have to make the decision that whatever you're dealing with is bad enough that it's worth the risk to go get help versus worth the risk of losing your job or your marriage. That is excellent advice. Uh, you kind of you kind of struck a chord with me and anybody watching the video probably saw the look on my face when <laughs> you talked you, you talked about workaholism. Um, Mm-hmm. That, that's always been something I struggle with. And, 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 uh, um, it's, this is a good segue to end the show because that's something I struggled with in my law enforcement career. I was the type, I mean, I, I enjoyed being a cop. I loved being a cop. And, um, even back when I was, uh, pushing a patrol car and had, you know, essentially I was punching in and out on a timesheet. Um, I was the guy that would always take overtime shifts. You know, I'd almost take it. I'd take an overtime shift like every week because, Um, it was fun. Like I just enjoyed being a cop. I liked being out there and and engaging with people. And I liked the adrenaline rush. I liked catching bad guys doing stuff and hauling them off to jail. Um, it was fun for me. And, um, I, but I think at the same time, I was also 
I was dealing with some things um, that not, I mean, not necessarily trauma, so to speak, in the, in the purest sense of the form. Uh, maybe you would tell me I'm in denial, but um, but I was I was addressing <laughs> I, was, I was I was dealing with things that I I chose to address by just being more uh, immersed in uh, in that in my job, and um, I have now admittedly taken that into my my life now after law enforcement and being a copreneur myself and running my own business um it is easy for me to get just stuck in what i'm doing and commit myself to it because when i am in my office and it's a safe and it's a quiet space and i like it and it's nobody invades my bubble in here mm-hmm. um and and what i'm doing in here i have complete control of what I tell it to do, it does. Right. And, um, it's not that easy when, when, you know, four kids, uh, under the age of seven and, you know, having to navigate a marriage and all the things that have to go on, uh, in my home life, it's easier for me to go in my office and, and convince myself that there are things I have to do there. Um, mm-hmm. because, I have complete control over those things. And I would guess that there are a lot of people that are listening to me say that right now that are experiencing the same thing. So we're going to talk about that more in the next session as we unpack the the workaholism and transitioning out of law enforcement. And that right there is why the podcast episodes are so long. <laughs> yeah, because I'm stuck in my office. But you know what? Right now, nobody else is home. So I can't, oh. I can't go spend time with anybody else, even if I wanted to. But um but yeah, no, that's great. So I want to remind everybody um, to find, uh, if you want to connect with Lauren, you can go to her website, laurenrich.net. Check her out on uh, LinkedIn and uh, YouTube. All that stuff will be in the show notes as usual. And uh, we're going to catch Lauren again on session three. Thanks again, Lauren, for being on the show. Sure. Pleasure. Hey, thanks for sticking around till the end of the show. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a review at psi.chat forward slash review. I would love to hear your feedback and it will also help other public safety innovators like yourself find the show. Be sure to check out the show notes for this episode. Just go to psi.chat, click on episodes and search this episode number and you'll find all the links, descriptions and resources we talked about. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe and you'll be notified when the next episode is live. Thanks again for tuning in and I'll catch you guys on the next episode.